yes that is quite a thing and that is uh, quite possible that Elizabeth cried over making this decision that's well done Highly unlikely that she was wearing that when she talked to the troops at Tilbury. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to my channel. This is a history police and this time it is me reacting and reviewing one of my favorite historical movies, Elizabeth, The Golden Age. But you'll see that I don't agree with everything they did in this movie. So the movie really like focuses on um, the 1580s and more particularly around 1585 and it is a very important time for Elizabeth I because the animosity between Spain and England is going to increase considerably during that time. Not only because Spain is now overtly supporting Mary Street, they always had, but now they're really putting you know lots of efforts trying to get Mary Street on the throne of uh, England but also because Elizabeth is playing cheeky and it's at the time where she's paying her privities or pirates into really attacking Spanish territories in the New World, uh, Spanish ports, but also um, even in Spain, in Cadiz, she, she gives the orders to attack um, Spanish territories. And this is quite remarkable because Spain at the time is the strongest European country and England is quite tiny, England is not as strong and here Elizabeth is like completely fearless, I want to say fearless, at the same time I want to recognise that she probably was scared of what she was doing um, because every time that you do something, every time you confront a bully, every time that you fight for what you think is right, there's always this side of you that there's always a fear <laughs> of what might happen but here she's kind of like driven by her own belief, own faith, and that what she's doing is right. So this movie really focuses on this part of history, and um, Kate Blanchett is remarkable in this movie, and I really, really recommend you, so here I'm telling you right now, I recommend it for you to watch. But also, I want to tell you what scene I'm like, oh yes, 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 and all the scenes where I'm like, Ugh. historically, absolutely inaccurate. Are you here to tell me I must murder a queen? I would never presume to tell my queen what to do. Only you know where your duty lies. Was it my father's duty to murder my mother? She was a queen. So in that scene, what I really, really like is the fact that she's asking this question. You know, we say that Elizabeth never really talked about her mother. It's absolutely wrong. Um, she discussed her mother in many ways, in subtle way, indirect way, in speeches, in, in audiences with ambassadors where she's really more direct. But here what I like is that we have Elizabeth saying, uh, was, was it my father's duty? And I doubt that she would see the same way. I doubt that she would made a parallel between her mother and Mary Stuart. And um, a, a few reasons for that. First of all, um, Anne Bonnet was not the Queen Regnant. And I think Elizabeth recognized that, right? I mean, she was Queen Consort, she was the wife of a king. And here making a parallel between an emotional as well, parallel between Mary Stuart and Anne Boleyn doesn't really work with me. However, I think, that a very good comparison would have been when her sister, so in uh, 1553, 1554, when her sister was, you know, with the same trouble with when she uh, asked for the execution of uh, Lady Jane Grey, but also when she released uh, Elizabeth from the Tower of London, deciding that actually she didn't want to go down that path. She didn't want to be responsible for the assassination or the execution of her half-sister and here we can draw a parallel. Obviously the parallel is also kind of faulty in many ways because there, <laughs> there is so much more going on between Elizabeth I and Mary Stuart. There's a longer relationship, there's, there's many more years of annoyance <laughs> but I think it would have been a better parallel than here bringing up um, Anne Boleyn. Since when were you so afraid? I'm always afraid. All right, I love this. I'm always afraid. That is 
so true for Elizabeth because if you look at my video on Elizabeth's you know, greatest fears, you also realize how vulnerable she was all her life. I mean, you have to understand the psychology behind her character. And there's actually a very good book that I'm gonna put down below by Ellen Castor, who um, discusses that even better than I do. So, um, but here it's, it's, it's brilliant because here you have the humanity of Elizabeth and it's what we want. We want to see, you know, in a movie, in a historical movie, we want to see the people behind these names. We mortals have many weaknesses. We feel too much, hurt too much. All too soon we die. But we do have the chance of love. Again, absolutely brilliant, this kind of conversation, though I don't believe that it would have been with Rayleigh. I think here there's like a mistake of uh, the importance of Rayleigh, like in, in terms of um, the psychological and the emotional state of Elizabeth I. But forget about that. What is really good is that Dewey, and that is goes back to, you know, in my video on Elizabeth I's greatest fears, when I discussed, you know, what she's feared of not being in love for the woman she was. Did she have the choice? To be loved and to love? Probably not. Mary Stuart must die. Must. Mary Stuart must die. Where is it written? Who says so? Have I ordered it? Majesty, this is no time for mercy. This is brilliant again because it really shows how Elizabeth was fighting this and she was fighting to, you know, to sign the execution of uh, Mary Stuart. And here it's brilliant because it was a very painful decision that she was forced to make in many ways. And what I love that I think we don't discuss enough between Mary Stuart and Elizabeth, all the men that were pitting them against one another. I'm not saying that, you know, these two women did not have their parts, especially Mary Stuart, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but here I think it's also something that we need to recognize and acknowledge the men around them, around them, not just around Elizabeth, around Mary, pitted these women against one another and I would have loved for this woman to actually meet in person never happened but I would have loved it because I believe that things would have been very 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 different if they had met by whose authority do you condemn me God is my only judge the law is for common men not for princes I love these two scenes like where Mary Stuart is like you know disputing the fact that they have no authority over her. And you, you have the next one, the scene where Elizabeth is exactly saying the same. That's, that's brilliant. And, and I believe that, you know, in many ways, um, they have lots of similarities um, in the ways they see their power and authority. They, they, it's really well done. The spot is, is brilliant. All right, Mary Stuart is going to be executed in 1587. And then we have the plot that, you know, where Spain is basically going full war on England. However, that scene is absolutely brilliant, the scene we're going to discuss together. However, there was no Spanish ambassador at the court of England in 1587. In 1584, after the Throckmorton plot, um, Mendoza, the Spanish ambassador, was expelled from England and there was no new Spanish ambassador until James I uh, of England's reign. So here, uh, that scene would have never happened the way it happened. However, it doesn't mean that we can't appreciate it for a few things. You know the enterprise of England. The enterprise, forgive me, I'm not familiar Two with armies landing on the coast of Sussex and Norfolk. Norfolk. Mary Stuart is to be set free and placed on the English throne and I am to be assassinated. Does any of this sound familiar? I know nothing of any invasion well, plans. I refer to this plan as the Enterprise of England. It should more accurately be called La Impresa de Inglaterra because it is a Spanish plan. The plan of my one-time brother-in-law, your king, to attack my country. Your country? It is my country that is under attack. Your so-called piratas, your pirates, attack our merchant ships daily and you... <laughs> you you think we don't know where the orders come from? It's a brilliant really because here Elizabeth is basically called out on what she's doing. She's spending a lot of money on her privateers, but she keeps saying that she has nothing to do with them. But everyone knows in Europe, 
including the French, that she's paying Drake to destroy the Spanish forces. So it's quite funny that she's called out um, on this, the way she is. Obviously, again, this would have never happened. Never an ambassador would have made such, you know, a, a bold claim uh, to her face. Uh, but here, what, what's brilliant is the reaction uh, of uh, and the acting of Kate Blanchett. You will leave my presence, sir. Go back to your rat hole. Tell Philip I fear neither him, nor his priest, nor his armies. Tell him if he wants to shake his little fist at us, we're ready to give him such a bite he'll wish he'd kept his hands in his pockets. You see a leaf fall, and you think you know which way the wind blows. Well, there is a wind coming, madam, that will sweep away your pride. The allusion to wind is remarkable because everyone thinks that the reason why the English won against the Spanish Armada is because of the wind. And though it is true that it played you know, a, a big role in this, probably having a storm is not easy, especially because the Spanish had very big boats, so very hard to maneuver. Well, the English had very smaller boats and so they it was much easier. They were also much, um, you know, acquainted with the weather in the channel, which the Spanish were not. And also, the Spanish forces that were supposed to come from the Netherlands never left. So they were, it was not the full armada they, they would have expected. Yet, they should have won when you just look at the numbers. But here I love, uh, you know, the reference to the wind and especially at how Elizabeth shows her full strength and the type of real powerful and fearless, though she's, you know, she's, she, she is fearful and, and she is scared, but here she shows that she's fearless and, and, and completely in power. That's, that's a remarkable scene and, and a remarkable acting. The Spanish were defeated um, the Spanish lost, or you can say England won. Um, but we have this iconic speech of Elizabeth given on the 9th of August, 1588, in the battlefield um, of Tilbury. But this scene, I was so looking forward to this scene. You know, when I watched the movie for the first time, I was like, I want this scene. Like, that's the most iconic, you know, speech of um, Elizabeth I. And gosh, the disappointment, guys. We see the sails of the enemy approaching. We hear the Spanish guns over the water. Soon now, we will meet them face to face. I am resolved in the midst and heat of the battle to live or die amongst you all! While we stand together, no invader shall pass! Let them come with the armies of hell! They will not pass! The disappointment for everything. No, she's not wearing a full armor. We know that she was re wearing a white dress. No, she would never have said those words. Why not use, you know, the words she said? I know have the body, but of a weak and feeble woman, but have the heart and stomach of a king and of a king of England too. The speech from beginning to end is perfect, so perfect. And actually the one who did a brilliant job at it was Helen Mirren in her um, movie, Elizabeth, where Finally, she said, you know, she said those words and it's what you expect. There's like such a high level of expectations when it comes to that scene and when it comes to that part of history. And it is such a shame that it didn't happen. So for me, though I love the movie and I love Kate Blanchett, I was a massive disappointment.
Well, obviously, this scene would not have happened, right? So she would not have Elizabeth on her own going to the coast of England, all of this. But it's quite dramatic, it's quite symbolic. I do like it. I do like it. I mean, historically, absolutely inaccurate, but, but in terms of entertainment, yeah. <laughs> The depiction for me of Philip II is a bit off. It looks like a bit of a feeble, weak um, man, you know, contrary to Elizabeth the Street you know, the heart and stomach of a king. So I understand why they do that, but at the same time, I think he would not have reacted like this. I think it would have had pure rage instead of like whipping. Um, and also we know that he didn't stop there. You know, like he, he, he was just like, all right, fine, you won. I'm good, I'm good, I'm stopping. That's not what happened. He's gonna try again in 1593. And even before that, the, the war, like the war still happened at sea. So. So yeah, I don't really like that sweeping, weeping man. Um, I think it's a, it's a bit of a missed opportunity on how to portray Philip II. All right, I don't necessarily see Elizabeth as someone very maternal. At the same time, I believe that she could be someone very caring. So I like this very human scene of her. And I like what they do here with um, showing how much she cared about her people and that she was the mother of her people. I think, it, I think it's well, well done here. I am called the Virgin Queen, unmarried, I have no master, childless, I am mother to my people, God give me strength to bear this mighty freedom, I am your queen. I am myself. I absolutely love the ending of this movie. And I love it so much because I think that, you know, the text, what, what she's saying is quite, um, quite true to Elizabeth's character. And what I love as well is that there's such a big parallel with her last speech, the golden speech in 1601, where she said, I have reigned with your loves. And I think it's a beautiful way of ending this movie. All right, uh, so this is it for this History Police video. Um, I hope you really enjoyed it. For me, Elizabeth Golden Age, I really recommend it. There are some problems of historical occurrences as we've discussed, but it is still a very good movie and I will give it an 8 out of 10. It's just losing two points for these scenes and the depiction of Philip II that is not great, but otherwise absolutely brilliant and uh, I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe and I'll give like a list of books that you could also if you want to know the real history that you could also look at uh, down below in the description box. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time in another video. Bye!